Welcome to today's lecture. Today we start a new chapter in our lecture notes, namely chapter 7 about uh, convex sets in vector spaces. And actually we will today treat uh, section 7.1 about the isolation theorem for cones. So this new chapter is about the things that are not uh, typical for uh, real algebraic geometry, but uh, which we will need as a tool. And uh, it belongs more or less to the area of uh, functional analysis. Uh, you might have heard, uh, you might have heard about parts of it uh, in a lecture on convexity or on um, or on topological vector spaces, or uh, of course uh, in lectures about functional analysis. So only in the last uh, section of this chapter, we come back to our main topics. But uh, so here we need quite a long way for, uh, for uh, having tools available, which we will need later. And um, it's uh, more or less an easy subject because we leave a little bit real algebraic geometry. And um, yeah, so uh, but it's very important. So in this chapter, k denotes always a subfield of real numbers. And, you know, uh, so um, in particular, k as a set is a subset of real numbers. Uh, of course, you have learned that um, every Archimedean ordered field can be embedded into the real numbers, in fact, even uniquely. Uh, so um, I might work also over, I could have worked over Archimedean ordered fields, but for some reason it's always, uh, it's, it seems to be convenient that I always assume that this ordered Archimedean ordered field is already in, um, is already embedded into the real numbers. So I just say K is a subfield of real numbers. And yeah, and equipped uh, with the order induced by the real numbers, right? So in, in this sense, it's also an ordered field. And I also need, uh, you, I also want uh, um, a topology on it. So I want to make it into a topological space. And I just take the subspace topology. You know, if you have uh, a set a subset of K, then it should be open if and only if uh, if and only if it's the intersection of an open set in R with K. <clears throat> you can uh, think about how this topology, how this, uh, topology looks like. Um, in fact, in case that K is real closed, uh, you know, there are real closed subfields of real numbers. For example, the real algebraic numbers build such a subfield. Uh, so in K that in, in the case that K is real closed, we had already introduced the topology on K, uh, namely the order topology. And it's an easy exercise if you want to do it that uh, this is exactly the same, right? In in fact, um, um, if uh, if K is not real closed, we did not yet introduce the topology, I guess, on K. Um, so. Yeah, I just take this subspace topology, which is induced by real numbers, unless otherwise specified, of course. And so our topic today is the isolation theorem for cones. And that's a theorem. So um, um, that's a theorem um, that uh, basically says the following. So if you have a cone, what is a cone? A uh, cone is a convex cone, so it should should contain the zero of a vector space. So you have V is a K vector space. So it should contain zero, it should contain the origin. It should be uh, closed under addition and under multiplication with non-negative scalars, right? So one example for, for such a cone would be the singleton set just with the origin, okay? But if I have uh, an additional point in uh, in this cone, then, uh, then uh, I have also non-negative multiples with elements from K. So in some sense, I have this half ray, where, of course, what exactly the half ray is depends really on K, on the subfield K. If K is real numbers, it's really a half ray in the literal sense. 
And then, uh, okay, that would be another, that would be another um, example for such a cone already, right? Such a half ray, uh, <clears throat> which includes the origin. That would be also an example for such a cone. And then, um, but if there is uh, an element, uh, another element in it, uh, well, uh, when it depends what this element is, it could, uh, by uh, um, <coughs> by chance, it could lie exactly on the opposite of this half ray, right? Well, when you get uh, you get uh, actually a straight line through the origin, that would be another example of such a cone, right? But all the examples of cones which I presented so far are a bit um, are a bit uh, pathologic. So in fact, uh, if you take a random, another random point, and you say that this should be in your cone, then it will perhaps lie here. And then, uh, you know, this half ray is also in the cone. And then, but also it should be closed under, under sums, right? So, so if you take any point in this half ray plus any point in this half ray, it should be again in there, right? So you see that you get something like, you know, a wedge or something, right? <clears throat> and um, and in, 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 so this was more or less intuition in the plane. Uh, well, it could, it could also be actually uh, something like a half space, right? Could also be something like a half, or it could be a full space, right? And, uh, but typically it would be something like in, in the plane, it would be something like a, uh, something like a wedge, something like this. And then in, in the, um, in, in three dimensions, right, it could be something like an ice cream cone. I mean, it could be like you have, uh, yeah, you buy an ice cream and, uh, you get it in an, in, in the ice cream cone and, uh, this cone really is uh, infinite, right? So that's a good thing about it. So you can eat ice cream forever. And uh, so it looks a bit, could look like this, right? I mean, everything, uh, it's hard to imagine, of course, if K is not the real numbers, if K is a proper subfield, then you have to be careful about this intuition, but, um, Yeah, so I guess you you see what I mean, right? Okay, so and of course uh, in, in three dimensions you see it gets already uh, quite interesting. Also in two dimensions of course there are other um, phenomena, even in the case where K is the reals, uh, of course uh, you could have something like this that part of a boundary is actually not contained in it, right? So this part of a boundary is contained in it and this is not, for example. Such things can happen. Here in three dimensions, there are much more things, uh, interesting thing, things which can happen. So for example, part of a boundary here could be flat, right? And part, so um, you could have something like this flat in, in a naive sense, right? Okay, so, so what you have here, really a flat part that lives in this plane, right? That, that lies in a plane. And then, uh, and then you have here, uh, yeah, and then, <coughs> if I draw it very well, right, and, and when the rest is round or something, right? So there are a lot of interesting cones. And uh, some people call it convex cone, they don't, uh, they don't um, uh, require a cone to be closed under addition, but that's uh, <coughs> That's very, very crucial for us that it's closed under addition. 
and uh, so we and we will always assume this. So we just say that's a cone, uh, what other people sometimes call a convex cone. We just call it a cone. And uh, you see, it's like a subspace of a of a vector space, but uh, you know, for a subspace, you would in addition you would actually uh, use a stronger axiom here. You would use that k times c is contained in c, whereas here I I have only the non-negative linear combination, non-negative. Uh, um, if you scale with a non-negative scalar, then it should be again in it. So that gives much more, um, yeah, that, that leads, so that leads, as you, I think you understood already, that this can lead to much more interesting sets and which are much more difficult to handle, right? So in some sense, this is uh, now semi-linear algebra, what we do here, right? Linear algebra you do usually do over an arbitrary field. So here we uh, here we chose so um, the theory of convex sets usually is treated only over the reals, mostly in the literature. Uh, here we chose to do it over subfields of the reals because it turned out that many many things uh, we can do over the subfield of the reals and it has also some applications later. So we chose to do this. So in the literature, you will almost never find uh, that this theory is developed over subfields of real numbers. We could have developed part of it uh, also over ordered fields, right? But uh, that does not have too many applications for us. So we just do it over subfields of reals. So a cone is called proper if it is not the whole space. That's exactly like you would call a subspace proper if it is not the whole space. Okay, so let T be a preorder of a polynomial ring over K and variables uh, that contain, so preorder, let, let's maybe um, recall what was a preorder. Uh, <coughs> So that was this definition. If A is a commutative ring, for example, the polynomial ring over K, and T is a subset of it, when T is called a preorder, if it contains all the squares, if it is closed under addition and closed under multiplication, right? So if it contains all the squares, when it contains also the square of a zero, which is zero, so it contains the origin. Uh, so in, in our case, if, if you look at A is a commutative ring over with subfield K of reals in N variables. When this is at the same time a K vector space, right? This is a commutative ring, which is important for the notion of preorder. But it is also a K vector space, which is important for the notion of a cone, right? So anyway, it contains zero because zero squared is zero and it's closed under addition. And uh, yeah, in case that it, uh, so actually it contains also one, right? And so if it's a cone, if it's a cone, then it should in fact contain also non-negative multiples, uh, non-negative scalar multiples of one. So it should also contain the non-negative numbers. If it's, a, if it's a cone, right, in this k vector space, in this k vector space. And on the other hand, um, yeah, if, if this is the case, if it contains the non-negative numbers, you know, when it's also closed under multiplication with, with this non-negative elements from K because of these axioms, right? So, in fact, uh, T is a cone in this vector space if and only if uh, this is true. So, so maybe let's um, now note this. So pre-orders are very, very uh, interesting um, special cases of cones in case that they contain here, that if I have a preorder over, over a subfield of reals, 
uh, that contains all neg non-negative elements of this subfield. So when t is, a, t is a cone, moreover t is proper as a preorder. Uh, what what did that mean? Uh, one two five. That meant that minus uh, one is not in it by definition. Yes, so uh, definition of proper is here. If minus one is not in it, then it is called a proper preorder. But when we had uh, characterization in the case uh, where one half, where two was invertible in our commutative ring, when, um, uh, when uh, preorder we say, we saw that the preorder is proper if and only if it's not the whole of a, and therefore, uh, since one half certainly is, uh, <clears throat> you know, two is in, in k, two, uh, two is in k, and it's of course non-zero, and therefore since k is a field, two to the minus one. It's also in K, right? <clears throat> so, and therefore, it's uh, in this commutative ring. So, 2 is invertible, of course, in this commutative ring. And therefore, T is proper as a preorder if and only if it is proper as a cone, right? That was by 1, 2, 5. Let's look at it again. here, right? So we used this here. Okay, good. So there is no, uh, whether I view it as a, as a preorder or a cone, uh, notion of properness is the same. Okay, so let V be a k-vector space and C a subset of V when the following are equivalent, C is a cone. C is convex, non-empty, and closed under multiplication with non-negative scalars. So convex sets that was introduced in 241. Um, and now you see also why uh, sometimes these things are called convex cones. Uh, convexity we actually introduced over an ordered field, right? So um, yeah. But now we have a subfield of real, so it's also a particular case of an ordered field. When A is called convex, so with induced order from the reals, A is called convex if and only if, uh, yeah, you know, with every, every two points, also the line segment be between these two points uh, is contained in it. So let's see. Okay, so from A to B, that's trivial you know, um, such a convex combination of two points uh, is, of course, a sum of non-negative scalar multiples of these points. And so, uh, so that shows that C is convex if it is a cone. It's non-empty because the origin is in it if it's a cone. And uh, yeah, and this is, was actually one, uh, one of the axioms anyway. And uh, the other way around, so if C is convex, non-empty, and closed with closed under multiplication with non-negative scalars, uh, yeah, f because C is non-empty, we have that, uh, and and we know that uh, zero, uh, scalar zero times C is contained in C. We c and zero times something um, is the origin in the vector space, you know it from linear algebra, so we get zero lies in C, so the origin lies in C. So that's a scalar zero from K, and that's the vector zero from, from, from B. So, um, so the only thing uh, what we have to show is that uh, C is, because we have this condition, we only have to show, it only remains to show that C is closed under addition. So let x and y be in C. Okay, when x half plus y half, you know, that's uh, certainly in C because of convexity, right? 
that's actually the midpoint from a, of a line segment between x and y. And thus x plus y equals uh, 2 times this uh, lies uh, therefore in c. Okay, that was really easy. Now comes a very crucial definition. Let c be a cone in the k-vector space v and u in v. When u is called a unit, and that's why we call it actually u, a unit for c, if for every x in v uh, there is some positive integer n, with n times u plus x lies in c. Okay, maybe let's look at this a bit intuitively. So I have here a cone. So I have here a cone. And I have a vector u. And this one will actually not work. The one I, I have drawn now will actually not work, but let's check this. So this will actually not be a unit. So the condition is that for every x in v, so that's just a point in our vector space, x, there must be a positive, uh, I, it must be, no matter where I start here, at which point x I start here, it must be possible to, uh, to get into a cone by adding uh, finitely many often u, right? So let's see what happens here. If I add here u once, I'm still not in the cone. If I add it again, I'm still not in the cone. So here it fails, of course, right? Okay, so um, yeah, um, let's give it a different try. So if we uh, move um, if we move you here, right? Uh, when it still doesn't work, right? Because, for example, if I start here, when I still don't get into the cone, right? I'm actually running parallel here, right? Um, but I never get into the cone. Okay, so let's maybe try uh, once more. So if I if I start here, yeah, then I guess it will actually work. No matter where I start, right? Uh, yeah, the drawing is not very good, but I, I I think you can imagine that I eventually always get into the cone. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that's the condition, and this unit uh, serves for doing some measurements, actually. You can think of U as kind of a yardstick that serves to measure something. And um, let T be a pre-order of, uh, uh, of a polynomial ring over K in N variables, containing the non-negative elements from K. When we have already learned that uh, T is a, is a cone, it's actually a very interesting cone for us. And uh, the, you know, there is this notion of, uh, of Archimedean uh, cone um, that uh, maybe we should remind what Archimedean meant, so 4, 1, 2, A. Um, Okay, so a pre-order T of A is called Archimedean if A T is Archimedean. And what does that mean? Uh, so a pre-ordering A T is Archimedean. So that mean, meant that for all A in A, there exists an N in N, such that N plus A lies in T, right? And uh, you, you could write this actually here as n times 1 if you want, right? So to get the analogy, 
Instead of n times 1, you have now n times u, right? So that is an additional motivation for the word unit, because the unit should play a little bit the role of a 1 in some sense, right? And um, yes, uh, for Archimedean, uh, the, the, the role that one plays in the case of an Archimedean, um, of an Archimedean preorder. Okay. So, um, if and only if one is a unit for T is Archimedean. If and only if one is a unit. For t, okay. So that's um, yeah. That that follows actually really from the definition four one two a. Right, it's really just the definition. This a takes the role of the arbitrary point x in our vector space, and this n yeah that's a positive integer and yeah. T is the cone now. Okay. That's very much the idea. So this example is very crucial because that's very much the idea that we want to um, we want we will often work actually in the polynomial ring, but also in subspaces of it actually. And um and uh, t will uh, often be a, a preorder or or the intersection of a preorder with a subspace, and these subspaces often will be um, so that one, they don't contain one, right? They don't contain the constant one polynomial. But nevertheless, I would like to have something like a one, like which is a, something which is as good as one is for Archimedean. Um, pre-orders, uh, and this will be the u, that will be the unit. Okay, but uh, at the moment we are still far from this application. At the moment we will really look at arbitrary vector spaces over subfields of reals, and uh, these vector spaces in particular can be infinite dimensional. And um, so the intuition for infinite dimensional vector spaces is, is quite limited, right? So you have to be very careful what you are doing. So proposition 716, let C be a cone on the k vector space V and U in V when we're following our equivalent. U is a unit for C. V, each element from V from vector space can be written as difference from an element of a cone with a positive multiple, positive integer multiple of U. A third condition is that uh, v, every element from V can be written as a difference of uh, an element from a cone uh, and a uh, non-negative scalar multiple, the scalar of course from K, negative scalar multi multiple of U. And uh, the fourth condition is uh, U lies in C. And every element from V can be written as an element from C plus um, integer multiple of U. And the last one is that U lies in C and every element from vector space can be written as an element from the cone plus uh, some scalar multiple of U. So these are all these conditions are quite, um, yeah, I mean, they are. Um, very nice conditions and, and they are all equivalent. Okay, so let's do the proof of this proposition. This is uh, not hard. Ah, there is the last condition, which I forgot to mention. Another equivalent condition. Okay, so let's, uh, so. So there is another one, F. Okay, so, so F is 
Uh, so last condition here is that uh, for all x and v, there exists an epsilon in a positive element from k such that u plus epsilon x uh, lies in c. Right? So that's, that looks a bit different and there is a good reason why I call this thing here epsilon because you should maybe think of it as being small. So in fact... Here you have your u, right? And now, no matter, you, so now you go into some direction x here, right? So x plays suddenly the role of a direction here. No matter what, what direction you, 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 you take here, right? Um, there is always, in each direction, there is a little epsilon such that u plus epsilon x lies in c. So so that means you can you can go that's that's another way of viewing the thing. So you can go a little bit from U away and you stay in in C, right? Actually U has to be in C. That's not explicitly required here, but you see that it follows from this also, right? Because for example here or here you see it. So U is in the cone. And 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 you can wriggle here a really little bit, no matter what what direction you you take, you you can go a little a little bit, you can take a a, a small step, uh, and you stay in in C. In fact, the whole line segment here, with respect to a subfield K, has has when to stay in C because it's a convex set, right? So that means you can go a little bit without leaving the cone. Right? And how far you can go, that might depend on the direction, right? Uh, how far you can... And, and note that V could be an infinite dimensional vector space. So you, you, you can imagine that, that, that this really depends on, on the direction. But you can go in, in, in each direction a little bit. And, and, um, and, and how far that, that might depend on, on the direction. Right. Okay. Uh, so let so let's uh, let's prove that all these things are equivalent. So from a uh, to b. So so maybe let's again look at the definition of unit because we might have forgot it already. Um, so u is called a unit. If for every x in v there is a positive integer n such that n u plus x lies in c, maybe we copy this here. Okay, so from A to B, from A to B, so if U is a unit for C, so for all X in V, there is an N in N, let's maybe write it here, so for all X in V, there exists a positive integer n such that um, n u plus x lies in c, right? So if, if this is the case, then uh, this x here, which is arbitrary, can be written as an element from c minus a positive integer multiple of u, right? Just bring this n u to the other side. Right, that's this. Then, of course, if this is true, then this is also true because we're not negative, uh, because we're positive integers actually, even when non negative integers are contained in non negative elements of k, right? Because one has to be, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> they are they are non negative, it's the order induced by the reals, and uh, one is non negative in the reals, two is non negative in the reals, and so on. Okay, so from C to D, 
Uh, so uh, why is U in C if I have this? Well, first of all, U is also an element from my vector space. So U has it must be it must be possible to write U in this form. So U is difference of an element from the cone and a non-negative scalar multiple of U. Right. So. Um, so if I bring this uh, this uh, to the other side, then I have here something of a form one plus uh, one plus. Okay, that's that is not written in a, in a good way. So one plus uh, some non-negative uh, element uh, times u lies in C. I cannot write it in, in this way, of course. So I must write. Uh, where exists a lambda non negative element such that one plus lambda times u lies in C. Okay, let me correct this in the lecture notes. And uh, and therefore uh, u lies in C because you know, I now can divide by 1 over 1 plus lambda, which is uh, also non-negative in K, of course. So, um, U lies in C. So, so I have already proven that U lies in C. So, fix now uh, an X in V, and I have to write it as, as such a sum, right? We have to show that X is, is such, a, uh, can be written as such a sum. So, uh, we use uh, so we use again this thing here. X can be written as such a difference here, right? And uh, now we use uh, so uh, the trick is that I choose an integer positive integer n that is greater than or equal lambda. I mean that's certainly possible. I am a case of subfield of reals with induced induced order. When n minus lambda. Uh, is non-negative, uh, non-negative element from K, and if I multiply this with U, I'm still in C because U was in C, and hence, um, and hence I have that X can be written as uh, X minus this plus this, and but X minus this. Uh, lies in uh, uh, you know because x lies in c minus lambda u okay maybe I should do this with color so x lies in c minus lambda u right and um, and n minus lambda u lies in c right okay um, Okay, so x is in uh, in this thing plus c, but of course you know here I have minus lambda u plus lambda u, so um, okay, so let's see. So this is contained in c minus n u, right? This is contained in C minus N U because the minus lambda U cancels with the plus lambda U here. Um, and, and you know, you have C minus N U plus C, but C plus C is contained in C. Uh, and this is contained in C minus uh, N U, where N is the bold face N. And this is contained in C plus Z U, where Z is the bold face stands for all for a set of all integers so from d to e uh, this is uh, this is a completely trivial uh, and because z is of course contained in k and uh, from um, from e to f from e to f so suppose that E holds and let X be in V. Now uh, we know that uh, X uh, is of a form C minus lambda U. 
for some lambda, yeah, a priori uh, plus lambda u, but that doesn't matter, right? I can also write minus here. I mean, uh, if I have c, if I have here plus lambda u, then just take minus minus lambda u and then write lambda for minus lambda. Okay, if lambda is less than or equal zero, uh, you know, because uh, u is actually in C, then I know that x lies in C, and consequently uh, u plus epsilon x uh, is, uh, you could, I could even take epsilon equal one if, uh, if x lies in C. Right, uh, and if uh, interesting cases where lambda is bigger than zero, uh, if lambda is bigger than zero, when I said epsilon to be one over lambda, it's bigger than zero, and it's in K, and when u plus epsilon x is contained in epsilon times c, yeah, that's quite clear because um, you know that comes from this here x is so uh, lambda u plus x lies in c because of this here and now i'm just multiplying by epsilon and um, so this lies when in epsilon c but that's of course u plus epsilon x and that's contained in c because epsilon is in k and bigger than zero yeah, and then, uh, and then uh, I have uh, what I wanted here. And now uh, the only thing that's missing is from F to A. So suppose that F holds and uh, we have to show that A is a unit. So suppose that this holds and we have to show this. So in order to show this, let X be in V. So we have to show that there exists this n such that n u plus x lies in C, right? So choose an epsilon, uh, uh, yeah, use now what we have here. So choose an epsilon bigger than zero in K, right? Such that u plus epsilon x lies in C. And choose an n in n with 1 over epsilon is less than or equal n. From f it follows uh, uh, that uh, u lies in c. Right, so um, why is this? Because... Um, <coughs> Yeah, take for x, uh, take x to be equal to u, and when we have u plus epsilon u lies in c, and from this it's easy because this is uh, means that uh, one plus epsilon times u lies in c, and now divide by one over one plus epsilon, which is positive element from k. So it's easy to see that u lies in c, and hence uh, n minus uh, n minus 1 over epsilon, which is non-negative, times u lies in c because c is a cone. And now n u plus x, right, equals n minus uh, 1 over epsilon times u plus 1 over epsilon times u uh, plus x. And this lies in c, you know, Now we slice in C. And um, 1 over epsilon times u plus, uh, I can write this in that way here. And so, and because, uh, so, so this is when contained in C plus 1 over epsilon times C. Uh, 
um, you know, because u plus epsilon x lies in c. And this is contained, and 1 over epsilon times c is contained in c, and this is in c plus c, it's contained in c because c is closed under addition. Okay, so these are all equivalent re reformulations for u being a unit for the, con for the, for the cone c, right? And they are all uh, useful. And uh, yes, and in particular, we have seen that a unit for a cone is actually an element of a cone, right? Maybe the most... Uh, best geometric intuition you get actually from this here. Okay. So, so let u be a unit for the cone C in the k-vector space V when u is an element in C and V is, every element from V can be written as a difference of elements from C. Okay, so this follows, of course, because you have here, I mean, since u is in C, it follows, for example, from this, right? Or also, uh, yeah, also from this, for example, together with u in C. So that's a corollary, and that's important, because, um, you know, C minus C, what's actually C minus C? C minus C, if C is a cone, satisfies, of course, also that zero is in there, right? And it satisfies, uh, it's also closed under addition. Easy to show, right? And it's closed actually under, under, under multiplication even with arbitrary scalars from K, right? Right, so I let you do this as an exercise. Just uh, distinguish the case where this scalar is non-negative, which is really obvious, and the case where the scalar is non-positive, uh, which can be done in exactly uh, the, the same way because, you know, because, um, yeah, because such a different if you take minus such a difference when you have again such a difference right okay good so c minus c is actually is actually uh, a subspace uh, and it's actually the smallest is the smallest subspace obviously containing the cone C. Okay, so because any subspace that contains C must also contain minus C and therefore C minus C. So it's actually the span. It's the linear span of C. Right, so um, what's the intuition for this? So if you have a cone, right, when you know it it spans actually the yeah it's um, you take minus c so this is the cone c and when you take here minus c and when you take uh, you know uh, all differences of these things and so you get the whole plane here right. Another extreme case would uh, uh, an, an extreme case would be, for example, that c is just this half ray, when minus c would be this, and then you get just uh, and you got get just this straight line through your region here, right? So it's the smallest subspace containing the cone c. So. This must be all of V, otherwise you have no chance to have a unit, right? And um, so, uh, so there can only exist a unit if, uh, if the smallest subspace 
containing the cone C is V, right? Okay, the units for a cone in K2VN, K2VN is a K vector space, right? And the units for a cone in K2VN uh, are exactly its interior points. Uh, okay, interior points with respect to which uh, topology? Well, there are two candidates uh, for topologies you might think of. The first is, so since we had our topology on K, which was induced by the topology on R, uh, we have a product topology on K2VN, product topology. Uh, or we have a Or we have, uh, you, you can think of K2VN being a subset of R2VN, and where on R2VN you have a usual topology, and then you have here where on K2VN the subspace topology. Subspace topology induced by R2VN. And yeah, I think it's a little exercise. You can do it, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the same. It amounts to the same in the end, right? So do it as a little exercise. And then uh, also um, what is written here is not completely trivial. Um, so, so we use 716F. We use this characterization here of a unit. And we use 525, five. well, 525 five was just, let's see, so it was, uh, it was just, uh, you know, characterization of interior, I guess, uh, what I meant probably this thing here. Right, so, so the interior consists of all points of a space such that uh, all points X such that there is a neighborhood around X, which is still contained in the whole set. Okay, so um, so I think if you do this exercise, uh, you have to be careful. So because, um, you know, I could maybe give an intuition in K squared, and for K2VN, it's the same thing. But uh, as soon as I, as I got to, uh, to infinite dimensional vector spaces, uh, this intuition would break completely down. So, um, so U, okay, so let U be an element uh, of K2VN. In our case, uh, K2. The question is, uh, okay, so maybe let's really do a two directions. So uh, if U is a unit uh, for the cone C, when it has to be an element of C, by the way, right? So, um, if U is a unit, when it has to be an element of C, and, and then it has to be, um, um, and then by, by, by this condition, I know that uh, for each direction, right, uh, I can go a little bit and I, and I stay in, in, in the cone. And, and how far I can go a priori might depend on, on, on the direction. Okay. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> You know, if C were just, just an arbitrary set, uh, that could lead to uh, dangerous <laughs> phenomena. So you, you could think of, you know, like something like a snake uh, form here. Uh, something like this. I think you, I, I think you know what I mean. Right, or maybe I should make it a little bit bigger. Uh, so something, some phenomenon like this. Right. 
So you can imagine that this is really made in a way that uh, if you if you are in this point, you can go and 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 then for for every direction you can go a little bit, right? And how far you can go really depends on the direction. So if you are if you are already uh maybe let's let's take a magnifying glass here. <laughs> it's still still not drawn very well. Uh so here it's like it should be here like right so okay so um so how far you can go would depend on what direction right in this direction you can go very far in 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 this direction here you cannot go that far anymore here you cannot go that far anymore but you can still you can always go a little bit right and and if if you had a set like this you know when this so if it's just r2 for example right when it's easier to to think of it when this this would not be an interior point of this set right but um but here i have this i have this convexity assumption here right that's a, that's a that's a cone it's convex so um so what so we are different ways of proving now that uh if u is uh if u is a unit so if it satisfies this condition that then it must be an interior point so one way of doing it would for example that you take here for the axis you take here all uh elements of a form sum from i equal one to n epsilon i or maybe let's say delta i delta i times e e i where e i is the i canonical basis vector so the i uh, unit vector and uh, delta i is arbitrary in plus or minus one right so i have so in this way i have two to the n vectors for x which i which i take and for each such for each of these two to the n vectors here there is always a delta but since these are only finitely many two to the n uh, is finitely many so i can choose the smallest epsilon right so actually i find when an epsilon there exists an epsilon such that for all delta in minus one one to the n uh, we have that uh, u plus sum i equal one to n delta i e i uh, lies in in c and and that that just amounts to say that for all epsilon bigger than zero um sorry that was uh where, where exists an epsilon bigger than zero exists an epsilon bigger than zero such that u plus you know minus epsilon epsilon uh, sorry i wanted to put an epsilon here such that u plus this hypercube here is contained in c right and then if you take the maximum norm on r to the n for example and we have uh, and and the topology induced on k to the n uh, so you so you see that you find such a such a ball with respect to a l1 norm right around u which is still contained in c right and uh and vice versa it's easier vice versa it's if it's an interior point when 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 this is immediate actually so so please do it again as an exercise so uh uh the main point is here that uh the condition for being a unit implies that it's an interior point and that's 
that requires some thought and and the other way around it's it's very easy if it's an interior point when it's a unit and and the for the implication from unit to interior point works only because i'm i'm here in a finite dimensional vector space and be, because i have here a cone right so so that's what you should uh, remember right but now we have a very good intuition for cones in k to n we have a very good intuition what the, what are its units okay so that was a bit a surprising thing so why did we actually uh, introduce unit in such an abstract way if it's just something very geometric well that's because we are actually more or less interested in infinite dimensional k vector spaces where our intuition would break completely down we don't we actually never put any topology on 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 these infinite dimensional k vector spaces later we will do so and uh, there are many ways of putting a topology on it and uh, but net that's actually not what we want we 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 don't at the moment we don't want to work with topologies uh, just that was just a remark to understand better the, the finite dimensional case the case of k to n now let V be a K vector space, see a subset of V and U in V. A state of the triple V C U is a K linear function, phi from V to R to the reals, right? So R is also a K vector space because K is a subfield of, of R. R is a K vector space, right? And I'm looking at K linear functions from V to R, right? Satisfying phi of c is contained in the negative reals and phi of u equals 1. Uh, we refer to the set S of Vcu of all states of Vcu, so that's a new notation, as the state space of Vcu. So this uh, is a subset um, of uh, R to the V. The R to the V is a real vector space of all um, of all uh, functions from V to R. But it doesn't matter that it's a vector space at the moment. So this is actually not a subvector space. It does not contain the zero function, the constant zero function, because you require here that phi of u is one, right? So it's just a subset of a set of all function of all maps from v to r of all functions v from v to r. And um, why is it called a space then? if it's not a subspace uh, and if you didn't put any topology on it, so it's also not a topological space at the moment. Well, it's just terminology coming from, well, from, from a branch of functional analysis, which is close to physics, close to quantum physics, for example. <laughs> but I won't go into this. Uh, and um, yeah. And, but it's a convenient, for us it was convenient to have a name for these kind of K-linear functionals uh, that, uh, that map the cone into one of negative fields and map U to one. By the way, you know, uh, U was, uh, we learned that um, you should often play the role of a constant one polynomial. Um, and uh, phi later on will sometimes be a ring homomorphism or, uh, um, or something which is a bit similar to a ring homomorphism. Uh, and a ring homomorphism by definition maps one to one, right? So if you take the role of one, of a constant one polynomial, uh, then 
you know, if you think of these ring homomorphisms mapping one to one, then it's not so surprising that you would like u to be mapped to one here also, to the real number one. So how should I think of a state? Well, how should we think of a cone first? We have already spoken about that. If you have here a cone, and if u is a u later will be a unit for the cone, of course, and uh, at the moment, even if at the moment it's just an arbitrary element, we think of it already as a unit maybe, right? So now you know more or less how to think of u in the case of finite dimensions. Uh, if you have v equals k squared, for example, And now, in the case where k is not a real, it's, it's a bit more subtle, perhaps, and, and maybe so, uh, maybe let's, um, maybe let's first think of a case, uh, to get some intuition, let's first think of a case where v equals real numbers, v, v equals uh, r to the n, or actually r to the 2, so that I can draw it. And in, in this case, um, such a phi is uh, given by, you know, by its kernel. And uh, yes, so, um, and by the value on some element which is not in the kernel, and such an element would be u anyway. So, you know, so, uh, I, I can think of uh, of phi as its kernel, and the kernel is uh, an, an n minus one dimensional subspace, then, right? So that's the kernel of phi, and uh, and then uh, here is where phi is where phi is bigger than zero. Right, oh, so phi is bigger than zero, right? And uh, and here is where phi, uh, maybe another color. And here is where phi is smaller than zero, right? And phi of u is one is just a normalization in some sense, or so it's in some sense. And phi of c has to be mapped to a non-negative real, so the cone c has to be contained uh, where phi is non-negative. So you can think of it as, a, as this being a half space, this being a half space, the kernel of phi together with this blue thing uh, is a half space that contains C, right? <clears throat> and the information, uh, because of its normalization, the information is really this half space thing. So that's a bit an intuition, right? Think of these half spaces. Um, but uh, it's uh, of course dangerous because we are now going to infinite dimensional vector spaces. So let k, so let's look at the following example. Let k be the, the reals and v be the polynomial ring over the reals in just one variable. Uh, I mean, actually, we are seen as an R vector space. And um, let p infinity is something you should know, still know, that's actually a prime cone here in the, in the polynomial ring uh, in one variable. That's, uh, that was the point at infinity uh, in the real spectrum of this polynomial ring. So it actually consists of all polynomials. It consists of a zero polynomial and all polynomials with positive leading coefficient. So when the cone C does not possess a unit in V, wow, right? So really a cone without unit, although it seems like a very big cone. And um, and we have that uh, uh, that there is no state. Uh, there is no state 
of, of VCU. <laughs> okay. For, and no matter what U is, right? So I don't have a unit, so I don't know what I should take for U, but no matter what U is, I don't have a state for SV, for VCU. Indeed, let U be in V, right? And uh, so U is a polynomial in one variable. So choose a, a positive integer D, which is bigger than the degree of U. And look at U minus epsilon times X to the D. And, and this, of course, this is a poly And no matter what epsilon bigger than zero is, this is always a polynomial with negative leading coefficient, right? And so it's never in C, right? And and so uh, by by condition uh, f here, you see that uh, uh, this is um, uh, here by this condition. So so you see in direction of x to the d or minus x to the d, you cannot even go a little bit. You always leave a cone c immediately. That. That, that violates condition F here. So, so here you see that U cannot be a unit, right? For the cone uh, C. So, uh, so U is thus not a unit for C. Now assume uh, that you had a state uh, of a VCU, right? Such a state uh, must map uh, cone C into the non-negative uh, numbers. Um, but uh, I know that epsilon x to the d minus u is actually a polynomial with positive leading coefficient. So uh, therefore it lies in C. So this must be mapped to something non-negative. And that's actually... Uh, since u must be mapped to 1, this is eps and phi is linear, this is epsilon times phi to the x to the d minus 1, and this must be non-negative. And that must be for all epsilon, right? For all epsilon, bigger than 0. Uh, but that's, of course, absurd, right? Uh... That's, that's absurd, uh, that's certainly not possible. No matter what phi of x to the d is, cannot be true that for all epsilon, this minus one is greater than or equal zero in the real numbers. So that's absurd. So there is no state. So there is no state. So there is no unit, there is no state. So there are examples like this. So this cone is uh, a very nasty cone, right? Uh, we, this will be not the uh, kind of cones that we will like later. Okay, so let's make another example where, where we are just in Q squared and K is Q, so it's uh, not infinite dimensional. I'm in a finite dimensional k vector space, very low dimensional, and um, and uh, and I take uh, and also here uh, we have to be careful what can happen. And let's make an example. So let's take this cone. Uh, so maybe I draw this. So here I have just the rationals and here also the rationals. And uh, so what what is this here? This is everything which is above um, everything which is above um, a straight line through the origin with slope square root of two. Uh, I mean this this straight line is actually um, defined only over the reals, so okay, so so what would it look like? It 
like this. Right. <clears throat> so this is uh, this is what the line y equals square root of two x, right? In the reals that makes a lot of sense. Uh, here, uh, if I take just rational points on this line, uh, doesn't make so much sense, right? Um, so actually, if one of the coordinates is rational, the other one cannot be rational because square root of 2 is not rational. So the only point that would really lie in q squared on this line would be the origin, right? That's why I draw it uh, in a dashed way, maybe. But now I take all points with rational coordinates lying above it, right? So... Right, so that's my, and that's a convex cone, the origin is in it. And it's easy to see that this is a convex cone. It's closed under addition, it's closed under multiplication with no negative scalars, very easy to see. Uh, scalars from Q, of course, now. And it's also easy to see that all elements uh, by, for example, by, the, by, by this remark, uh, 718, it's easy to see that all elements of this cone, cone are units, except the origin, except the origin. All other elements are units, right? So I have actually lots of units. Uh, and um, yes, so and, um, and and now there is no, there is no, so this is the dual space. So Q squared is here Q vector space and that's the dual space that consists of all linear forms on Q squared. So there is no Q linear uh, phi on, on V except the zero function that satisfies phi of C is contained in the non-negative uh, uh, rationals, right? But for each uh, U in, uh, in, in C with, uh, except zero, we have that there is actually uh, a state, right? And, and what makes the state different here? The state can map into one of negative reals, right? It can map into one of negative reals. So you see here that states are more flexible, right? So the fact that they can, even, even if k is not the reals, they are allowed to map here into the reals. We just need to be k linear, but we can map into the reals. That, that seems to be an advantage for the existence of states here. In, in these cases, right? So why is there no phi in the dual space? So why uh, set, uh, mapping the uh, C to the non-negative rational numbers except to zero function? Uh, okay, so um, note that, uh, note that, first note that Q squared equals C union minus C, you can see that easily or you can just say it follows from this last corollary here so from this one because i have units the cone has a unit admits a unit so um, <clears throat> actually many units as we saw and uh yes so there is uh uh, so we have this, and um, and now assume that um, phi, uh, we had such a non-zero phi here, right? Then there, there, there would have to be a point, well, then on, okay, so on, um, 
Yes, on a, on a unit, uh, phi has to be positive, right? Uh, because otherwise, if uh, if I had a unit, okay, so um, because I have it q squared. You know, look at this for example. Q squared equals C minus N times U, where U is any unit of C now. And so if I had uh, fine, fine dual space, if I have fine dual space uh, of Q2, sorry. Then uh, phi of u uh, must be uh, bigger than zero, must be uh, bigger than zero, yes. Because otherwise, uh, for otherwise, uh, and, and say phi, if phi is in dual space and phi maps for cone into a non negative uh, rational numbers. Uh, when phi of u must be bigger than zero if u is a unit for c, for otherwise phi of u is more less than or equal zero and it would follow from this here that uh, phi of q squared is uh, uh, greater than or equal zero then, right? Which would be absurd, right? So phi of q squared is greater than or equal to zero. That's absurd, right? Because when phi of phi of minus q squared would be, um, yeah, I mean, since uh, if if there if phi maps something into maps some element of q squared to a positive. If it mapped something to a positive number, it would have to map the opposite vector into a negative number, of course, and so and uh, and which would not be possible due to this. So this actually implies that phi is a zero map, right? Phi would then be a zero map. Okay. So yes. So. Uh, so actually, we have that every unit is mapped to something positive. So here, every element of C except the origin is is a unit, and therefore they all have to be mapped uh, to positive numbers. So we automatically had that. Uh, C without zero is mapped to positive numbers, and then <clears throat> minus C without zero is when mapped to negative numbers, and um, and so we only the only element which would be mapped to zero due to this could then be the origin. Only the origin could be mapped to zero, right? And uh, but that's not possible because what I mentioned, I mean, Q must have a kernel, you know. If Q from Q squared to Q is linear, when the dimension of a kernel of phi phi plus the dimension of the image of phi equals two, but this, uh, if this were zero, then this would be uh, yeah, when this would be two, and when phi would be the zero map. But where are these states? Well, that's easy to see. Uh, I mean, choose a basis of uh, R2, right? Namely, one uh, square root of two. And then uh, any other element uh, from... Uh, u from c without zero. Maybe this one, right? 
And then on this basis, we can define uh, an R linear map from R2 to R, R linear, by specifying that uh, one square root of two should be mapped to zero and U uh, should, be, should be mapped uh, to, to one, right? Note that uh, U really lies not on the line in R2 that's spent by one square root of two, right? Because U uh, is, uh, yeah, because U is in C, so it's in particular in Q squared. Okay, and, uh, and then uh, you can, so we have this R linear map, and when you restrict it, restrict it here to, to Q squared, Q squared, right? And then it's uh, of course still uh, Q linear. It goes in, it's a Q linear map into a, a Q vector space R. And it maps U to 1, right? And it maps um, C uh, to a, to a non-negative element. So this is easy to see. This is easy to see, and um, yeah, and then uh, we get uh, we get such a um, we get such a state here. Why is there exactly one state? In fact, okay, that's because um, so let's uh, take a state phi of let's take a state uh, phi from uh, um, of VCU <clears throat> where u is now fixed in C different from the origin and now um, we uh, if if we have a point uh, x in v or x y in v uh, and we can when we can write it uh, when there are there are unique I mean since v is contained in R two and uh, u together with uh, one square root of two, you know, one square root of two together with u build a basis uh, of, R, of the R vector space R2. I know that there are unique uh, lambda mu in R such that xy equals lambda u plus mu times one square root of two. And when the claim is that phi of x, y equals lambda. And then from, from this follows unicity. <coughs> and why is this the case? So, uh, so let, let, let me prove it, sketch maybe. So, um, we show that uh, show that phi of x y is greater than, greater than or equal lambda prime for all rational lambda prime with lambda prime less than or equal lambda, and then phi of x y is greater than or equal. Uh, sorry, it's less than or equal lambda prime um, for all la rational lambda prime with uh, lambda prime greater than or equal lambda, right? And uh, 
yeah, and for example, for A, how do you show A? Um, uh, let lambda prime be in Q with lambda prime less than or equal lambda. When xy equals lambda prime u plus lambda minus lambda prime u. Uh, ah, okay, it's, it's enough to show this for strictly less and this for strictly bigger. Okay, so lambda minus lambda prime so let this be strictly less, lambda minus lambda prime u uh, plus mu 1 square root of 2. Right, so I have here a multiple of 1 square root of 2 and when I subtract something positive, so this is positive, Uh, yes, when I add, oh, sorry, when I add some, some positive multiple of u, right? So I feel some multiple of 1 square root of 2, so I'm on this line somehow uh, in R2. And then I go a little bit in in this direction. So when I when I land uh, when I uh, when I get into this uh, yellow region, right? So when I get into C, okay. So this is in this is in lambda prime u plus something in C. So phi of x y is uh, lambda prime times phi of u and lambda prime is rational now so I can do this uh, plus uh, so this lies in phi of c so this is greater than or equal lambda prime okay uh, I have to be careful what I write but phi of x y is greater than or equal lambda prime Note that phi of u is zero, right? So and and in the same way I can I can show this thing here, right? Okay, so it's an exercise. So that was a bit technical, but uh, I think uh, you got uh, somehow um, some idea why I uh, even if I'm working in a k vector space with k a proper subfield of real numbers why I want the states to be real valued, right? Okay, so that gives just more flexibility for the existence of states later. Um, yeah, and now uh, an important lemma. So uh, let u be a unit for a proper cone C in the k-vector space V. So proper means C is not the whole of V. And I have now a unit and uh, then um, I define a uh, map rho from V to R, namely X maps to the supremum of all lambda in K such that X minus lambda U lies in C. Um, so let's make a picture. So here I have my cone. Right. And now I have some point x somewhere in my vector space, let's say here, and uh, need not be in the cone, but here I consider the case where it's in the cone. When I have my unit u, right, it's, you know, in this case, it's an interior point, in the general case, yeah, something like a yardstick. <laughs> Um, okay, so when um, I have here, um, yeah, what, the, what do I do? I, I subtract, I subtract here 
multiples uh, of u. So in this case here, I could say subtracting u, you know, so this is minus, I don't know, minus 0 0.3 u, for example, right? And I, and I look at the supreme, how long am I still going to, to be in the cone, right? And uh, so here, here the supremum would uh, perhaps be 0 0.3, right? So, so it measures somehow um, so if x is outside, if x is outside the cone here, right, then uh, I don't get in the cone by subtracting u's, right? So I actually have to subtract uh, minus u's, right? So... So maybe by subtracting minus u once, so it means adding u once. I still I'm still not in the cone, and maybe if I if I have a little more right here, then if I have one point one, maybe one point one times u. Uh, I'm uh, if I subtract minus one point one. times u when I get into a cone and that's uh, uh, and and yeah and I cannot do with uh, yeah and then the supremum would be uh, minus 1.1 or something right so this function rho here would uh, probably yeah would uh, uh, Yes, so I think it would be, it would look like this. So this is the level set of phi. This is where phi equals uh, minus 1.1, right? And uh, for example, this would be the set where phi equals uh, 0 0.3 right and um, and I guess this would be the set where phi equals 0 right so that's the idea and uh, phi of uh, uh, so, so it measures somehow how far am I from the cone uh, if I'm moving a uh, along directions parallel to u and uh, yes and uh, um, if, if this value if a value is positive when I'm at least almost in in the cone probably and if value is negative uh, I st I'm still away from the cone uh, and uh, uh, with uh, phi, uh, okay, why is it well defined? Because uh, you know we know that uh, since uh, u is a unit, that means that uh, okay, or maybe we look at one of these equivalent definitions here. So I can express uh, every element from. Uh, So every element uh, x here is of a form something in the cone plus some non-negative non element uh, u. That means uh, there is a lambda such that x minus lambda u is in the cone, right? You can see it from here. And um, so I'm taking the supremum over a non-empty set, right? So why, so I can do this in the real numbers. So this supremum is of course in the real numbers and I can do it um, if the set is bounded from above. Uh, so why is the set bounded from above? 
Well, we will see it in the proof, right? So in the proof, we'll show that this set is bounded from above. It's not hard. And then we we have that lambda x plus lambda, uh, rho x plus rho y is less than or equal to rho of x plus y. Right? So um, maybe in the picture... Um, so here, for example, here, here phi is minus 1.1, 1 .1 and, uh, and here also, right? Now if you, so let's say this is x, and this is the vector, okay, this is the vector y, this is a vector x. Now, if you take x plus y, uh, you are somewhere here, x plus y. And here, uh, it's probably already, uh, so rho of x plus y is probably strictly greater here in this example, right? And here, in general, it's greater than or equal. And uh, rho of lambda x equals lambda rho of x. Well, that's less surprising if you think of a picture. Okay. Of course, this is for non-negative lambda. Okay, so let's now uh, go into a proof. So fix uh, x and y in, in v and a non-negative lambda in k uh, for the, okay for the moment you need just the x uh, so for the well-definedness of rho we have to show that uh, since we are taking the supremum in i in i and in, in in r it's enough to show that uh, that this uh, set here uh, is non-empty and bounded from buff um, so look at the set of all, look at this set here, right? Um, and since u is a unit uh, for c, uh, we have uh, that i is not empty. I've already shown this. So it was, this followed from, for example, from this condition. And... Um, Furthermore, there is an n uh, a positive integer n such that minus x plus n u lies in C, right? Just because minus x is an element of a vector space, you can play that game. I, I mean that uh, you can play that game with any element of a vector space. That's exactly what it means that u is a unit. Uh, when um, lambda is um, uh, for all lambda in I, I claim that lambda is uh, less than n plus 1, so i is bounded from above. Uh, since otherwise, if lambda in i satisfied lambda greater than or equal n plus 1, then I would have the following. I would have minus u equals n u minus n plus 1 u equals uh, minus x uh, plus n u plus x minus n plus 1 u and but minus x plus n u uh, is in c uh, when here i have uh, uh, plus okay so so this is in c when here we x, I just uh, copy it and uh, and here I just artificially introduce a minus lambda u and I compensate here it here with a lambda u uh, and that's just a thing from above here. Okay, so when I have here c plus. Uh, uh, yes, this is in C plus, okay, X minus lambda U, um, 
is in C because uh, lambda is in uh, I, right? So x minus lambda u is in C. So x, so this, so this is in C. And then lambda minus uh, n plus 1 uh, is greater than or equal 0, right? So this is a non-negative scalar from k times u. And since u uh, being a unit is an element of c, of course, I have here a sum of three elements of c. That's again in c. So minus u would be in c. Uh, but uh, but um, if minus but minus u is not in C, so and then we have a contradiction. For otherwise, uh, C would be uh, the whole of uh, of V uh, by seven one six B, for example. So you know if minus u were in C, when you see that uh, every element from V would be. Uh, an element from C plus an element from C, so every element of V would, would be in C. That's not possible. So by 716B, by the way, I didn't want this to be in italic here, so I have to correct this in the lecture notes. That should be just... Just an ordinary B here. In the lecture notes. I have to correct it. Now choose sequences. Um, yeah, so now this is the well defined S. The well defined S is done. <coughs> now, um, um, choose sequences lam lambda n and mu n in k such that x minus lambda n u and y minus uh, mu n u lies in c for all n in n and the limit uh, for n going to infinity of lambda n is rho of x uh, as well as the limit of uh, mu n is rho of y you know i can of course approach the supremum by such a sequence um, yes, I mean, you can even choose it increasing if you want. <coughs> and then we have x plus y uh, minus, uh, minus this, uh, minus this, uh, minus lambda n plus mu n u uh, lies in c plus c, is contained in c, and thus we have that, uh, um, yeah, lambda n plus mu n lies in the set uh, whose supremum is lambda of x plus y. Uh, and this for all n in n. It follows that uh, rho of x plus rho of y is, the, is this limit plus this limit. Uh, and this is the limit of uh, for n goes to infinity of lambda n plus mu n. And uh, this is less than or equal uh, rho of x plus y because for all n, for all fixed n lambda n plus mu n is less than or equal rho of x plus y, so the limit also has to be. And um, yes, and uh, so I see here that I get this inequality. And moreover, uh, uh, lambda x minus lambda, lambda n u, <laughs> uh, you know, lambda was already fixed here, it's a non-negative element from k. Uh, this is in lambda c, right, because I had here that uh, uh, this lies in c, so I use now only that this lies in c here. Um, and was lambda times lambda n less than or equal 
So, so lambda times lambda n is in the set whose supremum is whose supremum uh, defines row of lambda x. And so this is less than or equal to row of lambda x for all n in n. It follows that uh, lambda times uh, uh, row of x is lambda times this limit is the limit uh, for n goes to infinity of lambda lambda n is less than or equal to row of lambda x uh, and uh, and analogously I get that uh, uh, you know you can do the same thing with one over lambda instead of lambda uh, if uh, lambda is not zero of course uh, because 1 over lambda is also a non-negative element from k. If lambda is not zero, it exists. And uh, when 1 over lambda times rho of... Uh, and you do it with lambda x instead of uh, x. You know, lambda x is... Uh, yeah, you do it with lambda x instead of x. And so you have 1 over lambda times rho of lambda x is... Uh, this way no equal uh, rho of uh, 1 over lambda times lambda x and so uh, you get uh, uh, rho of uh, uh, you get 1 over lambda um, you get sorry uh, you get in this way you get that uh, rho of uh, lambda x is less than or equal lambda times rho of x so you get uh, here we you get this the other way around so if if lambda is zero when it's anyway true right when you have zero on both sides uh, just note that uh, rho of zero is zero you can easily verify that row of zero is zero. And when you get this, this equation here for all non-negative lambda. Okay, so we have this for all non-negative lambda. Good, so we have proven uh, this lemma, this important lemma. So functional analysis would actually uh, call this um, sublinear sublinear function, right? So sublinearity uh, means exactly these two things, right? And um, Yes, so, um, and if you had here equations, uh, why sublinear? Because if you had here an equation, uh, then you would actually have uh, linearity, right? And uh, because that would, I mean, that would actually this homogeneity here would actually hold for all lambda in k then. So it's a weakening of linearity, sublinearity. So now uh, the isolation theorem for cones. Let u be a unit for the proper cone c in the k-vector space v when there is a state of vcu. There is a state of vcu. Okay. So why isolation theorem? So uh, here's your cone C, right? And then uh, you somehow isolate this cone. So you have a unit U, and you somehow isolate the cone, right? So you get it. Uh, think of uh, think of uh, uh, half space or something like this that contains the cone C, right? <clears throat> so um, you isolate it 
using a half space or something like this. In the general case, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we get it on one side of this half space in some sense. Uh, don't take the uh, word half space too litera literally because uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, we have here a k vector space. And, but the values of a, of a state can be reals. Okay, so yeah, so that's a very important theorem since the union of a non empty chain of cones in V is again a cone in V. Yeah, chain is a uh, is a set of such a chain of cones. That means it's a set of cones such that any two of them can be compared using inclusion. Um, the union of a non-empty chain of cones in V is again a cone in V. We can use Sorn's lemma to enlarge C to a cone of V. Uh, that is maximal with respect to the property of not containing minus u. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's important. So I I mean a union of uh, proper cones, a union of proper cones need not be proper actually, right? Um, so for example, if you take the real vector space of all univariate polynomials. Uh, inside there you have actually uh, the cones of which are actually subspaces even of polynomials of of degree at most d where d is a non-negative integer right and um, these are all subspaces these are proper subspaces and so in, in particular they are proper cones proper subcones or proper cones in Rx, right? But their union, their union is of course everything because every polynomial has a, has a certain degree, right? So here you see a union of prop, even a chain of proper subcones, it's actually a chain of proper cones must not be uh, must not be a proper cone, right? That's why I'm saying. But but uh, um, but if if I have uh, one fixed element, which is not uh, in any of these cones, okay, then it's also not in the union of these cones. And uh, here I have this one element because um, um, yeah um, so if if I here I have a proper cone C and I have this unit for for this proper cone C and um, Minus u is not in C. Minus u is not in C because if minus u were in C, minus u were in C, then v equals c plus or minus n u would be contained in C plus C and this would be contained in C and therefore C were, would not be proper. Yeah, and this here, this is actually uh, one of the equivalent conditions of u being a unit.
So I'm, I, I know that uh, minus u is not in C. And now I use this. Uh, so I look at a set of, I look at a partially ordered set of all C prime. C prime is a cone containing C. Minus u is not in C prime. <clears throat> yes, and um, every chain in this set, which is partially ordered by inclusion, um, has an upper bound in has an upper bound, namely the empty chain has C as an upper bound and um, a non-empty chain, a non-empty chain has its union as an upper bound. Okay, so by Sorn's lemma, this partially ordered set has maximum, has at least one maximal element. So, um, so we get a cone that is maximal with respect to a property of containing C and not containing minus U, but when it's also maximal with respect to a property of not containing minus U. Okay, so without loss of generality, suppose that C has already this maximality property. Yeah, right. So because um, this maximal element of this partially ordered set has also u as a unit, but that's clear, right? If I enlarge the cone, when every unit remains a unit, uh, that's trivial but important. If I enlarge the cone, when every unit remains a unit, and um, and every state of larger cone is also a state for a smaller cone, of course, right? So I, since I want to show the existence of a state, uh, yeah, so. So I can just already suppose that C has already this maximality property. So what does this help? So it looks like we have made our life only harder. If we, enlarge, if we make the cone bigger, everything gets harder. Um, not really, uh, because... Um, yeah, we want to show existence of a state. So the idea is actually, you know, if we start, I mean, if we start with a cone like this, and if we take this row here from a previous lemma, right? If a cone is proper, then I would like actually like this to be equal here, right? But if you remember, how did the level sets look like? Level sets looked like this, right? If you remember. So on these sets, the row had constant values. That doesn't look like row being additive or something, right? So uh, that doesn't look like row would be a state. So the idea is to blow up in a certain sense for C, like make, make C bigger, make C bigger, and even bigger, and even bigger, even bigger, even bigger, right? Until it is maybe something like this, uh, some kind of a, kind of a half space, right? You have, you have to be very careful with this. Uh, because um, we are working in arbitrary real vector spaces and also these are real valued functions with states. So be careful about the intuition, but that's, that's a bit of intuition, right? Once you have something like this, when the level sets are look like this, and when we have 
we are of good hope that this is a state. So that's the idea. The idea is blowing it up. The idea is inflated, right? Inflated. So, claim one. Now, uh, I suppose that C union minus C is the whole of V. Yeah, that corresponds already to this idea. Uh, that corresponds already a bit to this idea, right? C union minus C. Okay, so explanation. So let x be in v. With x uh, not in minus c, we have to show that x lies in c. Due to the maximality of c, it is enough to show that the cone uh, c plus, uh, yeah, I, I want to show that uh, x lies in c. So I'm taking here a cone which contains c uh, and x. Yeah, and the smallest such cone is obviously this. And I've just to show that this does not contain minus u because when due to the maximality property of c, this must be equal to c and therefore x must also be an element of c. But if we had, uh, but if, if this contained minus u, then minus u equals y plus lambda x for some y in c and uh, non-negative lambda, but when, um, you know, when of course lambda cannot be zero, so lambda is strictly bigger than zero, yeah, because if lambda were zero, then minus u would be in C. Yeah. So lambda is strictly bigger than zero. And so, but when I can divide by lambda, so I have in x equals uh, minus u minus y, one over lambda times this, one over lambda times minus u minus y, and since u uh, being a unit is an element of c and y also, so this is, is, this is a minus c and multiplied with something positive, one over lambda is positive. So it remains a minus c and that would be a contradiction because I said here x should not be in minus c. Okay, so that proves that c union minus c is v. So having, having Proven this now. The next thing is that uh, for each x in v, uh, we consider the, the following sets, uh, namely um, the set of all um, lambda in k such that x minus lambda u is in c, that's again the set appearing in this uh, it's again was it appearing appearing here right and uh, was it jx of all lambda such that uh, such that x minus lambda u is in minus c so that's that interval would uh, would be the corresponding interval for the cone minus c instead of C. Okay, so, and and I claim now that for all, so that's my second claim. So I claim that uh, for all uh, X in V uh, and for all lambda in IX and mu in JX, lambda is less than or equal mu. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the explanation is um, let x be in v, lambda in ix and mu in jx. When x minus lambda u lies in c and uh, and uh, therefore and and sorry and uh, mu u minus x lies in c. Right. And thus lambda minus mu times u. Okay. Lam, lam, uh, uh, sorry, mu minus lambda times u is mu u minus x plus x minus lambda u. That lies in c plus c, which is contained in c. So we have here a multiple of uh, of the of a unit that lies in the in the cone, 
but you but it's a proper cone and I mean if minus u lies in the cone then the cone is everything we had this argument already several times so that means that mu minus lambda must be greater than or equal to zero so if you had mu less than lambda when we had minus u lies in c that would be a contradiction to the cone c being proper proper Okay, so that's the second claim. And note also that by the first claim, by the first claim I have, in fact, that Ix, a union Jx, equals the whole of R, right? And, uh, and together with this thing here, uh, you see that... Uh, well, and, and, and also Ix is, where Ix is exactly the interval that, that appeared here and which was uh, non-empty and bounded from above, right? So you have, and, and therefore Jx is also non-empty and bounded from below. Uh, and so, so the situation is uh, in fact uh, like this. So you have here real numbers and you have here uh, ix and you have here jx right and i mean i i you could maybe investigate this further but i don't exactly i don't exactly know uh what happens here uh at the transition somehow right but anyway, the union is, is this, and every element from this is less than or equal every element from the other one, right? So, so consider now phi is defined by x maps to the supremum of ix. That was well defined. That's exactly the map from 7, 1, 12, which was sublinear. And here I hope, of course, that it's k-linear. So phi of x is, uh, I could draw it here. It's here where the transition happens from ix to jx, right? So it's phi of x. And um, yes, yeah, so, so, so but J, jx will, will help us to prove the next claim. And the next claim is that, uh, you know, what, what would you like for what would you hope for minus phi of x? So for minus phi of x, uh, you would of course hope that it is phi of minus x, right? And phi of minus x by definition is the supremum of all lambda in R such that, um, or lambda in K, sorry, supremum of all lambda in K such that, uh, minus x uh, minus lambda u lies in c, right? So you could write this as x plus lambda u lies in c and uh, in minus c, sorry, in minus c. And that's what I, what I wrote here in a slightly more complicated way by putting here a minus and a minus. And so you see that, um, yeah, so why did, why did I write it here in, 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 in this way? I wrote it here in this way so you, bet, you see that minus phi, in fact, is, uh, is uh, also uh, the functional from, from lemma, lemma 7, 1, 12, but not for... Uh, where you exchange c and u, c and u by minus c and minus u. Minus c is of course also a, a cone and uh, minus u is an order of minus c. It's, it's, a, it's a unit of minus c, sorry. Yeah, so you see that's... Uh, so minus phi is also such a functional. So that's what we prove here. It's the corresponding functional for minus c together with the unit minus u. 
So explanation. So let x be in V. Uh, so we know that the union of ix and jx by claim one is k, and uh, um, and by claim two we get that um, phi of x equals also the infimum of jx. Right. Uh, easy to show. Clear from the picture, but also you can show it easily in a formal way. And um, and hence, um, and hence, we have at minus five of uh, minus phi of x equals minus this infimum and um, this is uh, the supremum of minus jx, right? Minus the infimum of jx is the supremum of minus jx, easy to show. So the supremum of minus jx, so of, in other words, of a set of all mi minus lambda, such that lambda is in k and x minus lambda u is in minus c. And so here I can just exchange minus lambda by lambda. And I have it's the supremum of all lambda, such that x plus lambda u lies in minus c. And from 7, 1, 12, we obtain that... Um, uh, 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 phi of x plus phi of, of y is less than or equal phi of x plus y that was with sublinearity uh, and phi of lambda x equals lambda phi of x for all x, y and v and non-negative lambda since minus u is a unit for a proper cone minus c lambda 1 12 and claim 3 uh, yield also uh, yield the same thing for minus phi. So minus phi of x minus phi of y is less than or equal minus phi of x plus y. So it's the same thing but for minus phi instead of phi for all x, y and v. And okay, so and then it follows that um, it follows that uh, phi of x plus phi of y is greater than or uh, ah, so first okay, so let's see. So First, uh, first this is this, okay, and then uh, this gives, if you change sides here, then you get exactly this here, right? So, and now, so we have, in fact, equality here and here. Uh, yes, so we have equality here. And when you have phi of x plus in particular, if you apply this for y equal minus x, when you have phi of x plus phi of minus x is phi of zero, which I had already said is easy to show that phi of zero is zero. And hence, um, phi of minus x uh, equals uh, minus uh, phi of x uh, for all x and v from which we deduce that phi of minus lambda times x equals phi of minus lambda x equals minus phi of lambda x equals minus lambda phi of x. I can pull out the lambda because it's non negative. And then this is uh, um, minus lambda times phi of x. So I can actually also, um, yeah, so this is true for all non negative lambda. And altogether, phi of lambda x equals lambda phi of x for all x in V and all lambda, so all non-negative lambda, uh, that was clear uh, that was clear from the beginning somehow, and but also now for all non-positive lambda, so in fact for all lambda in K, so that means phi, phi is K linear. Okay, obviously phi of C is contained in one non-negative reals, you know, because uh, zero is in I x if x is in uh, if x is in C, right? 
when zero is is if x is in c when zero is in this interval of course and therefore phi of uh, uh, phi of an element of cone is non-negative and phi of u is one let's look why is phi of u is one if x equals u so what is i u i u is the set of all lambda in k such that uh, u minus lambda u lies in c so this means 1 minus lambda times u lies in c <coughs> So that's the set of all lambda such that 1 minus lambda is greater than or equal 0. So that's the interval from minus infinity to minus 1, uh, to 1, sorry. And the supremum is 1. Okay, so phi of u is 1. And therefore phi is a state of VCU. Okay, very good. So we found a state. So we found a state, right? So if you have a proper cone with a unit, then there is a state. Uh, let's see that we really need uh, this unit. So not every proper cone has a state. Well, we have already seen this, right? So we have already seen this. That was the example with a space of univariate polynomials here. Right, so here we had a proper cone which did not possess a state. So, and it also did not possess a unit. Uh, if it had possessed a unit, then it would have to possess a state. That's what's, uh, what we know now, right? Okay, good. So, when now comes a really trivial lemma. Let C be a cone in the k vector space V and X in V. When X is in C, if and only if X is in C minus uh, one of negative multiples of C. Uh, although it's that trivial, maybe it's good to have a little intuition about it. So, here's our cone. And the question is if some x lies in C. And uh, the idea is that uh, you take uh, the opposite, take minus x, and you look at a cone generated by C and minus x, right? So that's exactly this thing here. So that's the new cone you look, you are looking at. See. And yeah, x lies in C if and only if it lies in this bigger cone, right? <coughs> so that's the statement. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so you're somehow you're enlarging the cone. It's a it's a way of enlarging the cone C. Uh, and why guaranteeing that X is still not in it, right? And. Um, Possibly enlarging, in fact. Okay, good. So one direction, of course, is completely trivial. The other one, let x be in c minus uh, non-negative non elements of k times x. For instance, x is written as y minus lambda x with uh, y in c and lambda non-negative in k. Uh, when x equals... Uh, yeah x equals, uh, uh -huh. so I bring this to the other side, so 
1 plus lambda times x equals y, and when x equals 1 over 1 plus lambda can divide here because this is great, this is non zero because it's greater than or equal 1. x equals 1 over 1 plus lambda times y, and this is in c because this is a positive real number, and y is in c. Yes. Okay, so that was a really trivial thing. And now a corollary. Suppose u is a unit for the cone c in the k vector space v and x is an element of v. Uh, if phi of x is positive for all states phi of v c u, when x lies in c. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that, that's a test uh, for membership in a cone. So intuition is a bit like this, so that you have your cone. And um, and uh, you have a unit, and um, you would like to test if some x is in the cone. And the way you can do it, you you check it against all uh, states of E C U. State you can yeah imagine a bit like this. So that might be the set of elements that are non-negative under some state or, or that also. And if you actually at x they are also they are even positive, right? Then <coughs> if all these states of ECU are in fact at x even positive, then x lies lies in, in C. Yeah, the geometry is a bit subtle, so it's just a rough thing, you know, where well, space could be infinite dimensional, you're working over k, right, you have this condition that phi of u equals 1, etc. It's a bit technical, but uh, it's, uh, it's a bit, um, yeah, it's a bit somehow, it's a kind of positive stellensatz if you want, right? Uh, so you, instead of uh, proving that something is in a pre-order, you prove that it's in a cone. Later, it will actually be applied to a cones stemming from pre-orders or, um, or from quadratic modules also. It will be introduced later. Um, yeah, and um, so... I, I don't say that the converse is true. If x, x is in C, I, I don't claim that phi of x is, well, for all states, phi when phi of x is, of course, greater than or equal zero, right? So the converse, if x is in C, then, of course, phi of x is greater than or equal zero for all states phi of V, C, U. Yeah, but so it's it looks it, it looks like a bit like uh, Schmidtgen, right? But... Uh, in Schmidtgen, you would, for example, Schmidtgen's positive Sternsatz, you would have here the vector space of all, for example, real value polynomials. And then C would be uh, an Archimedean pre order, and U would be one. And you would test only on, yeah, in fact, on ring homomorphisms, right? Um, into the reals that map the uh, pre-order into a non-negative and yeah, one to one. Yeah. So here you test uh, somehow on much more. I don't have any, I mean, I don't have a ring structure on V, so you test really on all these states, okay? So, but we are going in the right direction somehow. Um, It's, everything is just much easier at the moment, but we are using different techniques. So suppose x is not in C. 
uh, we have to show that when uh, there exists, so I'm showing contraposition, right? If x is not in C, then it's not true that phi of x is positive for all phi. So there exists a phi such that phi of x is non-positive. We have to show this. Okay, by this little trick here, if uh, x is not in C, then uh, x is also not in this uh, cone uh, C minus non-negative elements from k times x. So this is again a proper cone. And u is a unit for C. It is, of course, also a unit for this cone, which can only be bigger, right? Uh, cannot be smaller, I mean, which uh, is certainly a superset. So by the isolation theorem, there is uh, 7113, there is a state of Vc of this uh, enlarged cone u. And this is, of course, also a state of Vcu. And, uh, and phi of x, uh, yeah, since phi of, uh, since minus x is in this, uh, in this cone here, phi of minus x is greater than or equal to zero, so phi of x is uh, less than or equal to zero. Okay, so that, that's a very important cor corollary. So you see that this isolation has already something to do with uh, membership tests. Confer uh, positive stands at the Schmidtgen's theorem in particular. Okay, next uh, we uh, do this. Uh, so I put it here as an exercise, but I think we'll just do it. Um, so, um, compare this to 7, 1, uh, 7, 1, 9, and 7, 1, 9 was, you know, the uh, uh, definition of a state. And remember that a state, uh, so the idea is here that C uh, is a cone, but uh, it can be, definition also works just if C is a, is a, is a subset, it works also, and a u uh, should be a unit for the cone C uh, in most cases, but it also works just for any element u in V, and we have defined the state of Vcu, if you remember, as a k-linear function, you remember that r is a k-vector space because k is a subfield of, of r, uh, as a k-linear function phi from V to r, mapping C into the non-negative reals and u to 1. Okay. And uh, when we call the set of all these states um, of VCU, the state space of VCU. And uh, yeah, now uh, why space? Well, now we are actually going to make it into a topological space so that this word space is uh, better motivated uh, soon. Right, so we are going to put the topology on the state space. So let V be a K vector space, C a subset of V and U in V, we equip V. Um, yeah, first, uh, first let's look at the vector space of all functions from V to R, uh, with pointwise addition and scalar multiplication, of course, and that's, of course, you know, a vector space. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, I, um, it is equipped with a product topology, um, yeah, you take uh, on the reals, we have our usual topology and um, this gives a product topology on R to a V, right? Remember that was the initial, that was an initial topology. Uh, <coughs> so that 515B was just a reminder on the product topology as an example of, uh, of um, what was the definition of a product topology as an example of an initial topology. So how does this work? So you equip it with the coarsest, you equip R to the V with the coarsest topology that makes all the projections um, <coughs> continuous, you know. So these are, you know, pi x from uh, R to the V to R should just be the evaluation, right? So. Uh, uh, map phi is evaluated at x. So all these, it's, uh, yeah, in general, these are uncountably many, right? 
uh, all these projections, it's put here, we take here the courses topology that makes all these projections continuous. That's a product topology on R2 by V. <coughs> okay. In a state space here um, is uh, of VCU is uh, a subset of it, right? And it's a um, convex subset, right? So, I, I mean, that's very easy. So, if you have phi and psi, uh, and you have a lambda in the interval from 0, 0 to 1, then you have to show that lambda phi plus 1 minus lambda psi is again uh, in the state space. So, it's again k-linear. I mean, you know that from linear algebra. But it also maps C again to one of negative numbers and U again to one. That's really, really easy to show. So it's a convex subset. So it's uh, convex, right? But it's also closed with respect to its product topology. Why is it closed? Well, you can write it as an intersection of closed sets. Let's try this. So, so it's an intersection of... Okay, so first maybe we should uh, express that we have uh, additivity, so that these uh, elements are additive. So I can do this by uh, taking the intersection of all x and y in V of uh, the following set, namely uh, phi a function from R to V from V to R, sorry, such that um, Px1 uh, of phi plus Px2, uh, or sorry, Px and Py. So Px of uh, phi plus Px of Py, sorry, <laughs> it's confusing. Py of phi equals Px plus y of phi. Okay. Uh, yes, so, or, or I could, if, if I want, I could also write it like... Uh, here minus this equals zero, right? So we will later argue why these sets are for each fixed x and y in V. We, we, this set here is, 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 is a closed subset, right? And then, uh, but this um, filters out all, this filters out all um, functions um, that are, um, that are not um, additive. I mean, next I want to filter out all that are not homogeneous, all functions that are not homogeneous. So I take another big intersection over all lambda in K and X in V, such that, so I take the functions phi, such that uh, pi X or pi lambda X, sorry, of uh, phi, uh, minus um, minus lambda pi x of phi equals zero, right? And uh, and uh, and then um, so that uh, that. Uh, says that phi is, uh, so if something is in this intersection, if it is uh, homogeneous uh, with respect to the scalar field being k, right? And uh, then I have here, okay, so that's uh, additivity, homogeneity, homogeneity, and then the next thing would be, uh, so that c is mapped to the non-negative uh, numbers, so that's also easy, but so that's an, an inter, a big intersection of all x in C, such that uh, uh, pi x, oh, oh, okay, so I have to be 
careful. So a set double all a set of all phi such that pi x of phi is in the interval zero to infinity in variables. And uh, and finally I intersect with all phi such that pi u of phi minus one equals zero, right? <clears throat> so these are um so um this is an intersection of a lot of sets, right? And I claim that all these sets are 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 uh, closed, and an intersection of closed sets is closed. So I claim that this set is closed. I claim that uh, this set here is closed. That this set is closed, and that this set is closed, right? And um, yes, for example, uh, maybe the easiest thing is to see this. This is just a pre-image under pi x, right? Okay, maybe let us write this. So this set here is just pi x to the minus one of zero infinity, right? And uh, so uh, that's, a, that's a closed set in R, this interval, this, uh, and then uh, that's a pre-image, and this is uh, continuous, this projection, right? This pi x is continuous because I had here a, uh, the, the initial topology with respect to these projections. Okay, so here uh, it's, uh, well, it's uh, also you could just, uh, maybe it's even easier here just to write equal one, right? When I can write it here as, as a pre-image of, again, a closed set, namely the singleton set one, right? Um, here it's getting a bit more complicated. So here I have to look at, um, uh, yes, so um, I have to look at the, at the, um, at the map, uh, phi maps to, uh, P lambda X. So for fixed lambda and, and X, right? P lambda X of phi minus lambda pi x of phi. And, and this map is, is continuous, right? Because it's a composition of, I mean, this map from R to a V to R. It's actually a composition of continuous maps. Namely, you have a uh, first map from R to a V to R to a 2 which maps phi to p lambda x of phi and uh, and uh, px of phi. <clears throat> so why is this uh, continuous? Well, such a map, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, a map into such a product is continuous uh, if and only if uh, its compositions with the individual projections are continuous, right? Uh, so I'm using here a uh, property of a product topology on R2. Actually, we will later use this property more, more excessive, <laughs> excessively. So what I'm what I'm using here. So maybe I should right away say what I'm using here. Um, I'm using this. So I'm using exactly this here. You know, M was here uh, equipped with uh, initial topology with respect to these maps here. And um, so we NIs were topological spaces already, and I had these maps from M to NI for each I in, in index set I. 
And M was equal to the initial topology with respect to this Fi, but it's a special case of a product topology. And uh, now if I want to see if a map uh, from another topological space into this initial, into this uh, uh, topological space equipped with the initial topology is continuous, then I have just to check if all these compositions with the Fi here are continuous. That's what we will use now and also later. Now we use it just for R2. Here we use it just for R2. So because this map here onto the first component is, is continuous, I mean P lambda x is continuous and because Px is continuous, uh, lambda and x are now fixed of course. Uh, this map is continuous, right? And when I look at another map from R2 to R, which maps, yeah, I don't know, maybe um, AB to A minus lambda B, right? <clears throat> right, and, and so if you compose now these two maps, when you get phi is mapped to, you know, exactly to this thing here, right? And, uh, and when I take care of a pre-image of zero, and I take care of a pre-image of zero, Right, so uh, yeah, and here, uh, and here it's uh, it's a similar argument, but I I'm going to R two a three here, with a slightly different map, and I'm taking again the pre image of zero in the end after composition with some other map which is continuous from R three to R. So here I see that uh, this is a huge intersection of closed sets and uh, yeah, and when it's, uh, it's closed, an intersection of closed sets is closed. Okay, so it's, um, so that proves that, um, that, um, that we state, um, that the set of states is um, a closed subset of our topological space. Of, uh, of this product space here, of R to the V. <clears throat> it's a closed convex subset. And I equip it with a subspace topology. The subspace topology is the initial topology uh, with respect to the inclusion here, phi maps to phi, right? So, this is equipped with a coarsest topology that makes this inclusion here continuous. Uh, now I use again, when is such a map here? Uh, so if, 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 if you, for the moment, just uh, think of some topology here, yeah? uh, not necessarily the one I have just told you about, but some topology here. When, when is this map continuous here? Well, uh, again, by, uh, I can again use, I think it was uh, uh, 5, uh, 1, 6. So I can again use exactly this thing here to see that um, this map is continuous if and only if all compositions with these projections are continuous, right? <clears throat> because here I had the initial topology with respect to these projections, right? Um, so, and, and now I'm taking uh, the coarsest topology that makes this map continuous, so I'm taking the coarsest topology that makes all these compositions continuous. So I'm taking, in other words, the initial topology with, res with, respect to the with respect to these functions, right? Because these are the compositions, of course. Okay. And uh, so, um, so I can say that, um, yeah, so I can say that uh, uh, this is, the, at the same time, exactly the, the initial topology with respect to these. Right, so when, when I don't even have to refer to this product space anymore. Uh, so maybe that makes it a little easier to work with a topology on the state space, with, which we have just introduced now. 
Here I refer to 516. 516 was um, some, you know, was some statement if you, it said roughly that uh, if you have a family of topological spaces uh, and you have also subspaces of these spaces, topological subspaces, so with a subspace topology, um, then, uh, you know, the product of the subspaces is contained as a set in the product of the spaces. And uh, it said that, uh, so now for uh, equipping the product of the subspaces with a, with a topology, there are two obvious choices. Either you first take the subspace uh, topology, and then you take the product topology of these, or you take the product topology um, on the on the spaces themselves on on the product of the spaces themselves, and then you take uh, the subspace topology of this product topology, right? And and that these two constructions commute. But I think it doesn't really it doesn't really uh, work here because this is not I mean the state space. In general is not uh, a product of uh, you know it's not of a form state space is not of a form product x in v uh, um, mx where mx is a subspace of r right <clears throat> so um so it doesn't really fit here so i prefer um i prefer to maybe delete this reference i think i put it because uh proof is quite similar but um uh, 514 is a better reference in the last statement in 514 really makes it clear so this is the key statement here. Okay, so so now we have equipped uh, state space with uh, with a topology, and now it's really a topological space. Uh, and now um, we want to see some properties of this topological space. And now, if we are in a special case where u is a unit for the cone C, so where C is a cone in the k-vector space V and u is a unit for it, when the state space is actually compact. Okay, so that's great. Uh, compact, that means quasi-compact in Hausdorff. Hausdorff means that uh, you can uh, separate any two distinct points by disjoint neighborhoods. And um, and um, and quasi compact means that every open cover possesses a finite subcover. Okay, so let's prove this. So since uh, u is a, a unit, since u is a unit uh, for each x x in v, where exists um, um, positive integer in x. Uh, so, so I choose actually one for each x, so that's why I call it an x, such that, um, well, x plus uh, an x u lies in C. <clears throat> uh, or, um, and, and also from, from, for, for plus x there is such an n x, and for minus x there is also uh, another n doing this, uh, and I, I could just take uh, the maximum of these two positive integers so that I can say for plus and minus x, the same nx works. So for plus, for both plus x and minus x, if I add nx u, I'm in c. Yeah, that I can take the ma maximum um, because, uh, because u itself is in c, right? And, and c is closed under addition. Yeah, so when we have for all phi, for all uh, states and x in v, that plus, uh, and yeah, I can, can now apply this here. For applying phi gives plus or minus phi of x. And uh, this is, you know, 
phi of nx u is nx of phi u and phi of u is 1. So I get here plus nx. Um, ah, here it's actually written, right? So, And since this is in C, it must be mapped to something non-negative because phi is a state. And thus, uh, phi of x, um, you know, that means actually that plus uh, minus and plus phi of x is less than or equal to nx. But that means that phi of x lies in this real interval here. Okay. So the state space is contained in this um, in this um, product of these intervals. I mean, set theoretically, it is con contained. <clears throat> okay. Um, so um, we know that. Uh, from from your analysis course, you should know that such a such an interval is compact, right? Okay. So, and uh, from from Tikhonov's theorem, when you know that this product, if you take a product topology, here, uh, you you get um, uh, you know you take the topology, the subspace topology on this interval stemming from R. When you take your product topology, and that's uh, that's when uh, compact uh, topological space by Tikhonov's theorem. And um, yes, with respect to the product topology. But the product topology on this is induced by the topology of, of uh, R to the V. That's the thing that I said, you have a product of spaces and a product of subspaces of these spaces. And then, um, yeah, it doesn't matter. So you have two product topologies, but one is the subspace topology of the other, right? So that was 516. So, so that's the subspace topology of R to the V. And... Um, so SVCU, you know, it was uh, closed uh, in R to the V. We said that it was closed in R to the V. Uh, but then it's also uh, closed uh, herein, right? Because, yeah, you know, um, of course, um, yeah, closed... Yeah, it's the intersection of a closed set with this, right? Namely, uh, of a closed set in this product topology with this. Namely, uh, the intersection uh, of uh, itself with this. <laughs> okay, so it's closed here. It's, so it's closed in a compact space, right? But if it's closed in a compact space, it's compact by 5121. Let's look at it again. Yeah. Closed subset of com closed subsets uh, of topology of compact topological spaces are again compact. Yeah, it's compact. So that's that's really nice. So we have uh, this compact uh, state space. Um yeah, now a uh, little exercise. So if M and N are uh, uh, topological spaces and F from M to N is continuous. If M is quasi-compact, then so is the image F of M. Uh, quasi-compact means that every open subcover has a finite, every open cover has a finite subcover. And um, what was this? 5, 1, 21. Yeah. Um, okay, so what does it mean that um, that f of m is compact? Well, it means uh, you know that's that no the notion of uh, 
sorry, quasi-compact, that's the notion of quasi-compactness of, of a subset, right? Which is, um, um, which means just that it's uh, quasi-compact if you furnish it with a subspace topology, right? So f of m is, you can either see it as topological space equipped with a subspace topology induced by n, um, <clears throat> or you can say it's it's a subset of a topological space n, and when you have this notion of a quasi-compact subset. Okay, so so why is this? Okay, so um, yeah, for for such subsets, okay, you you can check uh, quasi-compactness by taking an, an open cover. So if you have f of m is contained in some union of bi's, and these should be open in n. Uh, and we have to show that there is a finite subcover, but um, now since f is continuous, uh, uh, so okay, so m is then contained in the union of the preimages. Maybe we did this exercise already, I'm not sure. So that's open in M, right? If you have a point in M, then its image is in one of the BIs. So uh, it means it's in the pre-image of one of the BIs. So because F is continuous, these are open in M. Now M is, uh, yeah, and here you have, here you have actually uh, equality now, but it doesn't matter. So now M is um, M is quasi compact. So M is a finite subunion of this union, and then this means you know going back. <clears throat> so I find a finite J here, and this means uh, going back with I find a finite J here. Okay, so that uh, I think maybe we did this already. It's very, very easy. So images of quasi-compact sets under continuous maps are quasi-compact. Let M be a non-empty quasi-compact topological space and F from M to R be continuous. Uh, so I'm really going to R with its usual topology here. When F takes on a minimum and a maximum, it means uh, there are X and M in M such that um, f of x is less than or equal f of z, less than or equal f of y for all z in m. <coughs> so x would be a minimizer and y would be a maximizer. Of course, I need here non-emptiness, otherwise I cannot, <laughs> cannot expect this. Okay, so, um, yeah, why is this? Well, that's just because uh, f of m is is quasi compact is a, and therefore also compact of course because R is Hausdorff is a compact is a compact subspace of R right and um, and therefore it's bounded and and closed. And um, yeah, when you you can take the, the supremum, and the uh, and this will actually be a maximum, and you can take the infimum, and it will actually be a, a minimum. So let's do a proof. So let's do a proof. F of m is compact, hence f of m is non-empty, bounded and closed. Yeah, f of, the image of m is of course non-empty if m is non-empty, right? Um, bounded and closed, yeah, because in the real numbers, as we know from calculus course, uh, also from previous chapters, um, that uh, uh, compactness is equivalent to boundedness and closeness. Okay, so it's bounded and closed from the first two properties from the non-emptiness and boundedness, it follows that the infimum 
and the supremum exists in the real numbers, yeah, because in the real numbers I use the completeness of real numbers. Every non-empty set bounded from above has a supremum, for example. Uh, so in few moments supremum exists. The last property yields that, yeah, but uh, from the closeness you easily see that the infimum is actually a minimum, right? Do it as an exercise and the supremum is a maximum. And then we are done, right? So, so when we need just to choose an x such that f of x is with minimum and uh, y is such that uh, f of m, such that f of y is with maximum here. Okay, and now uh, we get the uh, last result for today. We get the strengthening of 7115. 7115 was with a corollary, with membership test, right? Uh, so this was, uh, this was, yeah, this was, uh, if, if this test is fulfilled, if, uh, if you have a unit for a cone and an element which is positive under all states of this uh, uh, cone together with this unit, then uh, it must be an element of a cone. Yeah, it was this uh, uh, membership uh, criterion. Okay, and uh, now we can strengthen this a little. Confer also 4 to 2. So what was uh, 4 to 2? Theorem 4 to 2 was uh, the Archimedean positive Stensatz. medium positive Stensatz and it says you know for example so if um, uh, yeah where I had an ordered subfield of real numbers so it's uh, actually now k or k right it said that if you have an Archimedean preorder in the polynomial ring uh, Archimedean preorder containing uh, no negative elements from k, right? And then actually uh, t is a convex cone. Right, so, sorry, I always just say cone. is a cone uh, with, with unit 1, right? <coughs> Um, and then uh, we had this, uh, well, we had some set S, we had some set S, uh, okay, of all X in R to N, such that for all P in T, Pi of X is non-negative. And we had F, a polynomial, when the following our equivalent um, f is positive on s and b where exists an n in n such that f is of a form 1 over n plus t plus something in t okay so and and here we have a, a little bit a, a similar situation so we have here um, we have here also, you know, uh, the one is uh, so one here uh, is exchanged by u, right? So here I have a u, and a u is a unit here, right? And um, and the f uh, okay, so the f uh, the 
F here. Uh, the role of the F is played by the, uh, by the X here, right? And our vector space V here uh, was this, okay, vector space here. <clears throat> and the C And we see here uh, corresponds to a T, right? And um, yes, so that's a, that's a quite similar statement, except that uh, we set um, um, we set S here, right? And we set uh, S of ECU. That's still probably some different things, right? Uh, okay, and, and you, you write here, uh, but you could think of S as evaluations, right? You could think of S, um, instead of S, you could think of all phi from Kx to R, such that phi is K linear, K linear map. And uh, phi is um, actually a, a ring a ring homomorphism. Phi is a ring homomorphism. And phi of C or phi of T in our case here is mapped to the non-negative reals. And yeah, phi of one is one. Phi of one is one uh, is already part of the definition of ring homomorphism, right? And um, so, uh, yeah, but I, maybe I could write here phi of one is one. And instead of ring homomorphism, I just write to a multiplicativity because the add additivity is already in k-linear. So for all fg phi of f times g equals phi of f times phi of g. So it's hardly hard, hardly readable what I write here. But so the uh, main thing is, yeah, and, and then instead of saying that f is, so these ring homomorphism obviously are evaluations in points x in R to Vn, and instead of saying f is positive on s, I could say that phi of f is positive for all these ring homomorphisms, right? So in fact, we have really a very, very similar situation. The only thing is that um, uh, you have uh, uh, this multiplic multiplicativity here. We don't have a corresponding thing in our state space here. Right, that doesn't even make sense because we we don't know how to multiply elements of v. So and, and for this for this multiplicativity, we will later try to find um, a substitute, and that we that means we will even go uh, to a subset of uh, S V C U. Uh, but that will come later. But for the moment, you see already there is a lot of things are parallel here only with multiplicativity uh, is completely different. Okay, so but we are going towards, uh, say, um, a version of the Archimedean positive Stellensatz um, that, that is more general, right? Um, we are not yet there, well. Okay, good. Um, So let's now prove it. Ah, there is, a, there, is a, there is a third thing, namely x is a unit for c. Okay, a third equivalent statement. So from b to a, um, from b to a, uh, that's completely trivial, right? You apply the, the phi uh, 
phi maps every element of C to, to a non-negative real. So phi of x equals 1 over n phi of u. Phi of u is 1. So phi of x is 1 over n plus something non-negative. So yeah, and then it must be, of course, positive for all phi in the state space. From B to A is trivial. So you could even follow that phi of x is greater than or equal 1 over n for some n. Um, from A to B, suppose that A holds. Uh, so if the state space is empty, uh, so one reason why A could hold is that the state space is empty. Uh, but then uh, by 7, 1, 13, we know that C is not a proper cone. Because if C is a proper cone with unit, then the state space is non-empty by 7, 1, 13. That was a very important theorem. Okay. Okay, let's go back to that important theorem. That was the isolation theorem, right? Okay. And so, so when C equals V and when, uh, and when uh, we are done, then we can choose N as we want, uh, you know, because this uh, statement is empty actually. Suppose therefore that, uh, that the state space is not empty. When uh, I look at a continuous function from the state space, we have now a topology on it, 2R, you know, it was actually equipped with the um, initial topology with respect to these evaluations. So this evaluation is certainly continuous. So I'm here, I have a continuous function, real valued function on a, on a non-empty uh, compact topological space. And this takes on a minimum and a maximum. And, um, but uh, yeah, but I, since only positive values are taken on on, on the state space, when, when I know that uh, there is a minimum mu for which mu is positive. Uh, and uh, so when I can choose an n positive integer range such that n, 1 over n is less than mu, and then phi of, uh, now I do my test, right, my membership test, uh, what I want to show is that x minus 1 over n times u is in C, and I can do this with my membership test. So I apply a state uh, phi to this, and so this gives this, because phi of u is 1, and phi is k-linear, and uh, this is greater than or equal mu minus 1 over n, but that's still positive, so because I chose 1 over n so wisely. <laughs> So the test uh, works, and uh, I, I know that x minus 1 over n times u is in C by our test 7115, which was um, a very, very, very important theorem. OK. So that's A to B, and now uh, B to C, and then C to B. So suppose that B holds and let y in v. So we have to show that, uh, yeah, because I want to show that x is a unit, I have to show that there exists a positive integer n such that nx plus y is in c. <coughs> now, um, I can, uh, yes, I can choose Yes, so I know that B holds, so there exists an n prime, a positive integer n prime, so that x is of this form, right? And a positive integer n prime prime, because u is a unit, because u is a unit, I find an n prime prime such that this is true. And now I set n to be the product of n prime and n prime prime, that's again a positive integer, and we obtain that nx plus y, uh, yeah, no, you, nx plus y is in, uh -huh. so because this was a product, that's, uh, yeah, so that's just, uh, 
Yeah, okay, n, n is n prime prime times n prime. X was in here. Y was, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, uh, re, uh, write the Y here again. And then this is contained in n prime prime times u plus c, you know, because positive integer times c is contained in c. Oh, actually, n prime times uh, c is contained in c. And then this is n prime contained in n prime prime u plus uh, plus c plus y. And n prime prime u plus y is contained in, is an element of c. So this is in c plus c, and this is contained in c. And when I'm done, okay. And finally, from c to a. I go back to A actually, not to B, but I know already where the A and B are equivalent, so I go back from C to A. So suppose that C holds and let phi be a state, we have to show that phi of x is positive. Choose an n in n such that nx minus u lies in C, because it's possible because x is a unit. And then uh, I apply now phi to this. When n phi of x minus 1 is uh, greater than or equal 0, and thus uh, phi of x uh, is greater than or equal 1 over n, uh, 1 over n, yes, and that's positive for all phi. Yeah, we are done. So you see we are going towards, uh, we are going towards more abstract versions of the Archimedean positive Stellensatz, but we are not yet there because you know, we don't have a substitute for multiplicativity yet. Okay, thanks for listening and hopefully see you next time when we will go to section 7.2 about uh, separating convex sets in topological vector spaces. And I hope you have a good time. Bye.